Hello there, I'm Adrian Patterson, and today we're going to be discussing Upchain and how you as administrators can get set up when you first get access to your tenant. We're going to start by going through an introduction to the settings environment inside of Upchain. We're going to go through the initial configuration of your Upchain tenant and how you might go about inviting users to your tenant and setting up teams inside of it. Now, anytime you get started with any kind of data management system, and Upchain is no different from this, and Fusion 360 Manage is no different from this, there is a lot of things to configure. It is a complex system with a lot of environments. Just have a look at what we're looking at the screen there. You've got data management, bomb management, change management, new product introductions. There is a lot of things we need to think about, and it's often overwhelming as to where you start in setting all of this up which is the point of today's video, to give you some direction as to where you go and start. And on that topic, where do we start? Well, included in Upchain, there is a fantastic get started, uh, getting started section. So you can go ahead, move across to Upchain, and we can go and find in here our getting started page, which would take us to all of the information that we might need in terms of setting up our tenants and how we're going to get going. Awesome. Thank you very much for watching this video. Cheers. Just kidding. I wouldn't leave you guys like that. Let's dive into these and have a closer look. All right. So how do we get to the administration section in our tenant? Well, after we've logged in, we should be able to click on this drop down next to our username in the top right hand corner. And this gives us this administration area over here. Now, if you do not see this, it means you are not logged in as an administrator. If you are meant to be an administrator, either contact someone else who's an administrator, or if there isn't anyone else who's an administrator, please go ahead and contact Autodesk Support so that they can make sure that you have been given the correct rights to your tenant. Now, clicking on this administration area takes me to the administration area for my tenant, which is broken up into various different categories. Now, I'm gonna highlight just a couple and talk about how it's broken up so that we can see where everything might be. We're going to start over here with our engineering section. So this contains things about where items might be, how they might be numbered, how they might be categorized, any attributes that need to be tracked in terms of those properties, any tenant settings and tenant properties that we might need to go and modify. We then go over to our business process area. And you can see that we have workflows, business process types. This is where we'd configure how things flow from one thing to another, any processes that need to be in place and how that all kind of works. We then have our users area over here where we can see users and teams mainly is what we're gonna be focusing on today. And that is how to go ahead and create users and invite users into your particular tenant and how to set them up inside of teams so that they can start working with the roles that we want them to have. First thing we're going to be looking at is our tenant properties. So tenant properties enable or disable specific features inside of your tenant. This controls how things behave, essentially. Now, some properties are not modifiable by users themselves, and this would require Autodesk support to enable that particular property. So if you encounter one of those that you wish to turn on and you don't have access to, contact Autodesk support to do that. I promise there's not that many, so it is actually fine. Um, most of them we can get to. Now, we should be aware of some important properties and as a best practice, enable them. Can. So we're gonna go through some of these properties now and see which of them we might have an interest in turning on or off, although you should be thinking about all of these when you are doing this. So the first one is the file name pattern. Now, number one, Upchain requires that you have a unique file name uh, when it's being uploaded. So this is not something which comes as a choice. This is something that needs to happen. So by default, the value for this is the original file name of the file. So if you say if this is part one dot IPT, it would become part one dot IPT inside of the tenant. Now, this is fine as long as you don't plan on creating too many part ones. So if you want this to be changed, you can change this to something like the description there. So item number, item name, and then extension, because then that would give the item number, then the name .ipt, for example. Okay. The next one that we've got to discuss is supplierpart.bp.enabled. So this enables suppliers to be able to view and manage business processes and the tasks that are assigned to them and then perform any workflow actions that are associated with them. 
Remember, this is a way that you can enable suppliers to actually work inside of your tenant. So if you're not going to be working with suppliers, disable it. If you are going to be working with suppliers, enable it. Allow import with missing files. If you go ahead and turn this on, it will allow you to bring files or bring assemblies in that are missing or have suppressed files. Um, but no item is created for the missing or the suppressed files when you do so. Now, file version change when enabled each CAD file requires a description when it has been changed. So if you do this, it would enforce that when a change is made to a particular file, it would require that a description of what has been changed is entered so that we can track exactly what has happened there. Now I've got some more on the next page. So drawing create DWG. So when this is enabled, it's going to create a DWG each time a new version of the drawing is created. So it automatically exports it as a DWG. The one below it is exactly the same, except rather than DWG, it is PDFs. So it would be generating a PDF each time that drawing is updated. Um, the next one we've got is restrict project creation. So when this is enabled, it's not going to allow anyone to go ahead and create a project. Instead, enforcing that only tenant administrators can create a project inside of the tenant. Now, there are, are some others here for you to go and look at in your own time, show a new item, etc., the ones listed under additional key properties. All right, so now that we've gone through that exhaustive list of options that we can go and configure and should possibly consider configuring, let's jump into Upchain and configure one of them just as an example. Back in Upchain, we can now go ahead and click on the Tenant Properties area here underneath Engineering, and inside there you will see a list of all of the properties that you can go and configure. Some of them are Boolean, in other words, you can take them on or off. Others of them have you know, values associated with them, such as uh, your custom report bomb item limit, so 3,000 items, for example. Or if we looked at the naming ones, you can see the file name pattern there for us to go and configure our file name. Now, the one we want to go and see is restrict uh, project creation so that only tenant administrators can create a project. If you wish this to happen, what you can do is go and tick sorry, click on edit and then tick this particular value and save it. And that will configure this particular uh, property for your tenant. The next thing you might want to modify in your upchain tenant is your item numbering and attributes. So by default, when you uh, get given your tenant, you will have the following item numbering configuration set up. So it has a unique identifier on the far left hand side that is comprised of nine digits. It then has those uh, revision numbering, uh, minor and major revision, revision numbers shown there with the XX and the XX, and then it has the item name. We shouldn't be able to identify our items based on the number. We rely on the item name to tell us what that item is. The item number acts as a unique identifier for that particular item inside of the tenant. We don't need it to be readable because that tends to lead to more complex systems and difficult to manage systems. Now, I have some configured, which I'm going to show you shortly, which do break up that number into, is it an assembly? Is it a part? And I can show you how to configure that. Back in our administration area, we can go ahead and click on item numbering. And in there, you can see I have a number of item rules already created. Let's have a look at one of these just so we can see exactly what's going on. You can see that it is applying to all divisions. The item type is set to manufactured item, purchased mechanical part. It's then got uh, how the revisions are controlled, major with two characters, minor with two digits. Um, and then there's a, a list of excluded characters for the revisions. And then it has a bit of a preview of this particular one. You can see it's going to have PT for the first one, meaning it's a part. Dash, it's got a context sequence. It's aware of the context to make sure that it's then unique. It's then got a dash and then some free text. In this case, it's got two characters, which could be entered to enter any kind of information that we might like to store in that way. So we could have a set, a set list of different characters which mean different things in terms of our designs. Okay, now if we wanted to create a new one, we could go ahead and click on add new rule. And let's say, for example, we want our virtual items to have a different naming scheme. Now, once again, I can choose whether I want it to be characters or digits for this particular one. So let's leave the default, which is two characters for major, two digits for minor include some characters to be excluded so let's go i comma o comma q for example comma z just as a, an example 
and we can now start adding some information in here. So we want our first bit to be fixed text. We want it to be VI for virtual item. Okay. We then want to go and click on the add at the bottom, which is then going to give us the limiter. We can add again to give us the next one. So let's go and call this context sequence. Make it five digits starting from one. Add another one, which is another delimiter. And then we can add free text with a maximum of how many characters we'd like. In this case, we're just going to put it back to two. And we can leave this blank in terms of the default. And when we click create, we will now have a virtual item one. Now that is still in its draft state. If I wanted to publish that, I would need to go and click here and publish it. Okay. With all of these, note that they are version controlled. So if I wanted to create a new version of any of them, I could go and copy as new version and that would just make the old one inactive, allowing me to modify the new one as draft and then publish it in the same way. This means that you can keep modifying these rules as you go along. Now onto our item attributes. If we go ahead and click item attributes at the top, we can see we have a list of item attributes that have been populated in the tenant by default. And we're now going to add a new attribute to this. Now I've already gone and preset this up, but if I was adding a new one, I would go ahead and click add new attribute, fill out all the information and information is going to be exactly the same. The name of the attribute is uh, going to be called inside of upchain, a description of what it is, what kind of data type is going to be populating this attribute. Uh, it, by default, it should be set to an item attribute because it's an item attribute. And the status is going to then be active, obviously, because we'd like this to be active, uh, whether we'd like it to be searchable or not, or whether it should be included in a workflow process or not. I already have one set up here, so I'm going to click on product code. And this one, if I go and click on edit, will allow me to modify this. So you can see its name is going to be product code. Its description is going to be for an ERP uh, integration with Upchain. Let's say, for example, we wanted that product code to go all the way in there. Uh, the data type is going to be text because it's going to be reading that text from an I property inside of an inventor file. And we'd like to set its status to active and give it a mapping. So the CAD mapping section at the bottom is what I'd like to do with you guys. So we have three options, none, which is obviously there. I mean, you can just leave it as an attribute to be filled out as you need it. But we can also write an attribute to a file or read an attribute from a file. So writing an attribute would be something like major and minor revisions. We might like to write to an attribute inside of that file to populate, let's say, for example, a drawing border. But to read an attribute means that it would look at that file and read, OK, this product code that's been entered while we were designing this file, we'd like to pull that information into the product code attribute inside of Upchain and then use that inside of workflows and make it searchable. OK, so if we go and click on add mapping. We can then go and choose the type of file that we're going to be uh, importing it from. So in this case, there's a whole bunch of options. And the one we're interested in is Inventor. And we're then going to go and find uh, product code. And we can click Add Mapping. Well, we don't need to click Add Mapping. That's already been added. And we can just go ahead and click Save. And that will add that particular attribute to our tenant now. At this point in time, we can consider our tenant to be configured enough for users to start moving into it, start working. So we need to start inviting people to work inside of our tenant. But in order to do so, we need to understand exactly what the user licenses and roles mean for adding users. There are four main user license types inside of Upchain. And we're going to start with a simple one, which is professional. Now, this is for anyone who should be using CAD software with Upchain, tenant administrators, and maybe uh, project managers who might do a little bit more than your ordinary project managers in terms of adding to workflows, configuring things, that kind of thing. Um, it allows them to go and create and define business processes, templates, and business rules, and create and manage a whole bunch of projects, as well as integrate into major CAD systems and create and manage bombs. Now, one tier down from that, we have our team license. Now, this is mainly for project managers, contributors, and feedback givers. So this works with a different add-in, which we'll get to in a second. But it also allows them to view 3D CAD drawings and create markups and be an active part in any workflows that are going on inside of Upchain. Next, we have participant licenses. So participant li licenses are, you know, for completing BOM data in the web application and maybe viewing CAD drawings 
inside of the web application as well, creating some markups, that kind of thing. It is not as active a user as the previous one. And finally, we have our viewer licenses. Now, this is our license with the least amount of rights in terms of what it can and can't do, but it allows them to view released CAD files and drawings, view business processes, dashboards, and team resources, and to participate in any investigation requests, change requests, or change notices which are currently in play. Now, on that subject, each of these licenses has access to different plugins. So you can see the professional is the only one that has access to the CAD plugin. Team can go up to Outlook uh, plugin and Office plugins. And then your participants and viewers are based specifically in the web application and don't have access to any plugins or software installed on their machines. All right, let's start creating some users. We're going to go ahead in our administration section to our users page. Now this is going to give me a list of all users who are currently active in this particular tenant. I can then go and click on invite users on the far right. I can input a user's email. I can then go and ask, or I can tell it what role I'd like this user to be. So in this particular case, Alex is a customer manager and which division he belongs to if your particular tenant has multiple divisions. In this case, I've only got one. Okay. So now that I've done that, I can click invite. And that would then go and send them an email to go and log in using their Autodesk credentials. This is important. They would log in using their Autodesk credentials into their new account. Once you have created a couple users, you're probably going to want to set up some teams for those users to be a part of. So if we go to the teams section inside of our upchain administration area, you can see I've already got one for MFG tech. Now I want to go and create another team. So let's go and click on create team. Now this brings up this window here where I can input the name of this team. So let's go and call them customer management. And we can go and select which users are going to be part of that particular one. So we can add our invited users who are now our customer managers, as well as we can ask Rob to be part of that team. And once done, I can click create and that will create another team with those users as part of it. Thank you very much for watching this video on the initial setup of your Upchain tenant, and please stay tuned for further installments in our Upchain series. Cheers. Thank you.